Good morning, Emmaus family and friends. Greeting on this third Sunday in March, but the fifth Sunday of Lent. I would ask you and invite you to turn your attention to the gospel according to John. And in your reading, hearing, I'd like to read chapter number 12, verse 20 through 30, 33-ish. Uh, okay, and while you're going there, I'd like for you to consider for a moment the theme or the thought for glory's sake. Again, John chapter 12, verse 20 and following. And for our hearing, I'll read the New International Version. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. And they said, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verily, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. And anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must actually follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. God, the creator, will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it's for this very reason that I came into the world. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it, said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. But Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Would you pray with me and would you dare to pray for me? Let us pray. Dear God, indeed, you are a creator, the very lovers of our souls. We thank you, Lord God, that you allow us to gather in this place and in this space at this moment. Even now, Lord God, we recognize that we come to this worship, encounter this worship experience with all manner of emotion. For so many of us, oh God, who are deeply grieved with the assault, the injury and the murder of our brothers and sisters of Asian, American and Pacific Islander descent. Lord, heal our hearts and hear our prayers as we stand with those who grieve and we weep with those who mourn. Lord God, we pray for all families who are struggling and who continue to struggle during this pandemic. I pray, Lord God, for our hearts that are heavy. I pray, Lord God, for those who are wearied and for those who are almost ready to give up. So I pray, Lord God, that in this moment, in this word, you would speak to us and speak through us, O oh God, that we might hear your voice and we might discern your will and we might be encouraged to continue to become the people that you already believe we are. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For glory's sake. My Lord, my God, what a week that we have had. Kirk Franklin and his son carry on a very private moment made very, very public. Grammys that were awarded to some and snubs that happened to others. Megan and Harry and William and the Queen, oh my. Children and others crossing the border at Mexico seeking asylum. A slaughter of Asian Americans by a white man who walked away unscathed again. A teacher who forced a five-year-old boy to unstop, unclog a toilet with his bare hands. Vaccines and variants and viruses and violence. Mental health crises and grief overwhelming. And the dual pandemics have the nerve to continue. If we are honest with ourselves, in the last few days, more than a few of us have become emotionally triggered and fatigued and spiritually bankrupt. We have been enraged, we have enraged, we have co-signed on crazy, we have shouted, we have taken sides, we have publicly stood with our brothers and our sisters, we have recommitted ourselves to the fight for justice and equality for all, we have cried and we have prayed a whole lot. 
Some of us are numb and sluggish and disoriented and depressed and drifting from certainty. PTSD, present traumatic spiritual dissonance. When not enough things around you or in you are making sense, when our faith is being suffocated by fear and foolishness, when the vaccines are increasing and the stimulus checks are coming, but things still continue to happen to set us back and recovery slows down, the resilience is slow to come. And then think of all things, next week is Holy Week, the beginning of the journey to the cross with Jesus, a time when we are supposed to focus on the suffering and the sacrifice and the slaughter of Jesus. We don't talk about it much, but the crucifixion is one of the greatest moments of spiritual dissonance among believers. It's hard for us simply to make sense of it all. We know that somehow Calvary and the cross secured, procured, and guaranteed our salvation, but we tend to shudder at the cost. We realize it was an act of loving devotion, but we cringe at the reality of the pain. We admit that eternal life is absolutely possible, but we are unsettled by the notion that life comes at the expense of death. And so it is no wonder that so many of us simply want to cry out and say, now my soul is troubled. Hold on, God. Wait a minute. Can you just save me and save us? If you find yourself feeling that way or have felt that way recently, you are in good company for real, for real. Because that is what Jesus does in John chapter 12, right around verse number 27. The Bible says, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Now, I know that many of us would want to rush to Jesus's response, right? We want to rush to his dedication and his commitment to God, where he says that he would not dare ask God to change the possible path that is before him. I know we are uncomfortable with the humanity of Jesus. And in John 19, we try to overlook when Jesus in all of his humanity says, I am absolutely thirsty. And he tries to make plans for his mama and his friend. I know that we don't like to think that Jesus might might have had second thoughts even for a moment about all that was about to unfold. But how do many of us know that often God will ask us to do something that is not going to be easy? Beloved, the truth of the matter is our calling does not exempt us for the complexity, confusion, and competing priorities. Our commitment to God does not mean that there won't be some plans that seem absolutely ridiculous. Our faith doesn't always mean that we will have confidence every moment of every single day. Beloved, it is possible and probable that we will be obedient and hesitant at the very same time time. Sometimes on this journey, God will ask us and we want to do something. And our first response is, God, is there another way? Do I really have to tell my whole truth in order to get my needs met? God, can you bless me even without me doing the heavy work of restoring my own credit? God, do I really need to make a public apology to the child that I have offended? God, do I really stop, have to stop eating? late at night in order to get my life back under control and have healing in my body. PTSD. God, must I really go to therapy and maybe even take the medication that they prescribe to facilitate my wholeness? Do I really need to study and pray and fast and journal to hear the voice of God? God, isn't there another way? Why don't you just miraculously save me? I know we want to hurry up to the death so that we can hurry up to the resurrection of Easter morning. But beloved, resilience requires persistence. Recovery will often demand that we walk slowly. 
In fact, I'm discovering at this stage and age in my life that it's all about the journey. The journey is a real thing. And in fact, I'm coming to believe that the journey is the thing. Sometimes we have to simply be honest about the things that trouble our soul. So today I want to ask you, what truth do you desperately need to admit? What freedom will be released when you stop lying to yourself and other people? See, Jesus was truthful. And it wasn't just a rhetorical question in the text. And some translations read it that way when he says, now my soul is troubled, what shall I say? But some translations make it a hard stop, period. Now my soul is troubled, <sighs> Wusa, stop, pause. And then Jesus says, oh, what can I say? When he comes to the reality, he needs to say the truth. It's the truth, I believe, that set Jesus free to move onward and upward. Jesus was able to bounce back from that PTSD moment because he reconciled that his next step in obedience to God was somehow connected to the very glory of God. So it is with Jesus, maybe it is with us, that if we really desperately, deeply, and truly want to bounce back from the trauma that we have experienced, if if we really want to have resiliency, if we really want to have recovery, we might need to actually stop and tell the whole truth. That is the pathway out of PTSD. It begins with the truth. Because somehow when Jesus tells the truth, he reconnects himself, he rebounds and reconciles himself with God's plan, God's purpose, and God's pace. So I ask us today, we who are followers and friends of Jesus, how do we move from doubt to determination, from isolation to expectation, from the seemingly relentless trauma that is among us? How do we recover from these waves of PTSD? We must make glory our goal. We must make things and do things for glory's sake. You all know what glory is. Glory is the weighty presence of God. It's the power of community. Glory is the presence of the spirit. It's the beauty of wholeness and holiness. Glory is the reputation of justice, the manifestation of the realm or the family or the dream of God. Glory is elevation and veneration and adoration and praise. Glory is life lived in the shadow of the will of God. Beloved, our resilience is intimately connected to God's glory. Now, this is not to be confused with the glory that shall be revealed. This is not limited to the glory that we will experience in the afterlife and eternal life. No, this is a present kind of glory and adoration. Jesus was not simply committed to his death and life after that, but Jesus was fully and deeply committed to our lives right now. The manifest presence of God in the earth right now. For glory's sake. See, I get a little bit nervous. Okay, a lot nervous. When we focus on the death part. When we fixate on the gory details of Holy Week instead of the glory details that are also present and will be revealed. Remember, Jesus died as a result of the choices of men and women who refused to believe and receive and build the very dream of God that God had a vision for the whole world. Jesus was executed because he dared to speak out against bigotry and sexism and racism and exploitation. Don't get it twisted. Jesus just wasn't trying to get dead. He wasn't just trying to die. He was committed to our lives so much that he was even willing to face death, standing up for the dream of God to be made manifest in the earth. His was an act of defiance to the empire, and it was an act of obedience to his creator that we might all become fully alive. Maybe we need to let go of this commitment to death, destruction, and devilish decisions. Maybe we need to recommit daily to actually living. I'm reminded of the famous quote by the second century saint, St. Irenaeus, and he said, the glory of God is a living man, and I will make that a living person. And we have popularized it to say it this way, the glory of God is a person fully alive. 
In one regard, St. Irenaeus was saying that it is God's intention that we experience the abundant and full life that has happened and completed in the heavenly realm. He was suggesting that when we die, all things will be made fresh and anew, completed and perfected, and it would be glorious. But in the larger sense, we talk about this phrase, we have rightly expanded it to say that there is room for some life to happen even right now while we are yet alive. We will glorify God when we are our full, whole and healed selves right now when we share our gifts, our talents, our testimony and our treasure. That is life and that brings glory to God. Now, I know that some of us will want to run ahead and think that this is permission just to focus on yourself, your stuff, your people and what you want. You will hear this as permission for self-fulfillment, self-absorption, self-centeredness, egotistical decisions, abusive and idolatrous behavior and preferences. But that is not what I am saying. Do not hear me say that. This life is not all about you or yours and what you want for yourself and yours. Community reflects reflects the glory of God. Unity reflects the glory of God. Diversity and safety and living a life free of intrusion is for the glory of God. Therefore, let me say without a shadow of a doubt that I stand against every practice, policy, and philosophy that disregards children, that destroys families, that dismantles voting privileges, and that dehumanizes any person. I rebuke those who legislate as if their actions don't deserve accountability. It is not all about you or your party affiliation or your political aspiration. I rebuke and cast down those supremacist ideologies that sanctifies the murderous actions of white men and women who carelessly murder folks of Asian and African and Latino and Latina and indigenous descent simply because he or she believes that he is the only one that gets a right to live. I refuse to accept the double standards and inhumane treatment Boys who are brown and black, younger and older. America, we have so much to repent of. We have so much more to turn away from. Lord, have mercy on our very souls. What I'm trying to say is that you cannot be fully alive at my expense. As it was with St. Irenaeus and as it was with Jesus, they both understood that the glory of the Lord is manifest in the living of the people of God. There is something about us being fully committed to our purpose and our plan that God has shown us that it brings glory to the reputation and the very name of God. God's reputation is greatly enhanced by gracious, generous, and good people. Yes, that is why Jesus went to the cross because he made a commitment to be fully alive and he wanted everyone else to be alive too. The goal was always about life. Everyone being fully alive, mind, body, and spirit being connected to community and to purpose that was and continues to be the goal for those of us who would be dare to call ourselves the friends of Jesus and if you don't believe me that life was always the goal and life was a commitment that Jesus made and life was given to bring glory to the reputation of God take a walk backwards through the book of John now we're in John chapter 12 but it confirms it over and over again if you started John chapter 14 verse 6 Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life then you go to John 10 and 10 the thief comes only to kill steal and destroy but I have come that you might have life and that to the fullest or in abundance then John 7 3 and 8 says whoever believes in me streams of living water will flow life John 6 48 says I am the bread of life John 6 35 says Jesus declares I am the bread of life whoever comes to me will never Never go hungry. John 3 16 for God so loved the world. John 1 and 14 says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. If you have the message version, it says Jesus became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. 
all for the glory of God. And John 1 and 4 says that this, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. From the beginning, the glory of God was connected to life. We see Jesus, we see the manifest glory of God. And so you might be asking, well, then how do we, as folks in a contemporary situation, glorify God? If we want to glorify God, if we want to enhance the reputation of Jesus, if we want to be fully alive, if we want to be people who are resilient and in recovery from the trauma that we have experienced, one of the first things that we need to do is that we have to refuse to get distracted. Beloved friends and family, please don't get distracted. See the words in verse number 20. It says, now there were some Greeks among them, those who went up to worship at the festival. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee with a request, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. This is an amazing text. When you start reading this text, you have to understand the Greeks were coming up to the festival. Some believe they were converted Jews. Others believe they were Gentiles. Whoever they were, they have come from a place to a place to worship. Now word on the street was that Jesus, the miracle worker, the supernatural provider was in town and they said we would like to schedule an appointment with this Jesus. They came for an appointment. They wanted to come see for themselves. They interrupted Jesus' travel schedule and his movement because they wanted an audience with Jesus. They were simply a distraction, friends. Because if you remember your Bible scriptures in the reading of the book of John, you know that when Jesus was walking past and he was calling disciples, he called them to come and see. He invited them to come along on the journey. He made space. But by this time in his ministry, he was doing something else. He was on a different plan and a different path. And these Johnny come lately said, come on, we want to see. Notice they had not been invited as he had done in the beginning. Don't you know that's what happens in church to them all the time? Not here at Emmaus. I'm just saying, Julie speaking, that some people are invited and called in to a place and other people just simply get up and come and insert themselves in this text I'm suggesting that Jesus says I can't even answer your question because I am in a different space in a different place may I recommend beloved that if we want to stay on the path of resilience and recovery we cannot get distracted by people who just want to come and see it didn't necessarily mean they wanted to follow they just wanted to see they want to see what you're doing they want to see how you're doing beloved we have a purpose and a plan and a pace that we are supposed to keep up with if we're going to realize what God has for us. Far too long, we invite people to come interrupt our plan and our purpose with a two cent at the last minute, and it interrupts the things that God is doing in our lives. Beloved, refuse to get distracted. Some of us need to tell our friends and even some of our folks, I've been at this too long to stop now, to be interrupted now. Listen, beloved, Jesus does not even answer their question. Look in the text. If you keep reading he don't even answer the question he talks about the hour of man the son of man come he's like I don't have time for this friends we got to refuse to be distracted we can't be distracted by people or popularity or power we cannot even be distracted by praise resilient people who want to recover we have to stay the course the thing that God told you to do keep doing it the plan that you have keep doing it don't give up now don't refuse refuse to give up now just because other people want to have some insight or some insider scoop on your life beloved don't get distracted the scripture then says in John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. The second observation in this text, I'd like to say after we refuse to be or don't be distracted, don't be delayed. Jesus has a keen sense of timing in this text. He says the hour has come. It is finally time. It is time to move this way right now. If you all remember, if you read the book of John, there was this understanding that Jesus would say that some things were not to be done at a particular time. Remember, remember the wedding at Cana, one of the first signs in the Bible, the first miracles. He says, he says to those who need help, it's not yet my time. Jesus understands that there is an appointed hour and an important time to move. 
food. And in this moment in John chapter 12, he couldn't stop for a meeting because he was on another timeline. He was moving from miracles to mission to completion. He said, no, the hour has come. That season has passed. I have to keep going. He told those people in a nonchalant kind of way, I am not operating by chronos time, your calendar, your dates. I'm operating by God's Kairos time, God's perfect moment. I cannot be delayed. Beloved, we have to know when it is our time. It can be the right person and the right thing, but it can be done at the wrong time. We have to know how to tell time and we have to refuse to be delayed. We have to move at God's timing because if we don't, it slows down and hinders our healing. Beloved, I have discovered that hurry and scurry lead to spiritual dissonance and sloth and slothfulness leads to spiritual decay. Beloved, seize the day. Carpe diem. Now is the time for the church to get right and arise. Now is the moment for us to stand together against arrogance and ignorance and evil. Now is the time. The hour has come and is come. The whole whole earth is groaning and moaning, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to appear. The world is waiting for the followers and the friends of Jesus to stand up and speak out and shout out from the mountaintops and bring glory to the name of God. The hour is now. Don't be delayed. Stop praying now. Begin exercise now. Call the counselor now. Delete that number now. Freeze things now. Write the sermon, a speech, a proposal right now. The hour is shifting. Won't you shift with it? Number one, don't get distracted. Secondarily, don't get delayed. The third thing I find in this text is don't allow the vision to become diluted. Let's keep reading in verse number 24. It says, very, I tell you, this story about a grain of wheat has to fall into the ground in order to produce more fruit. Beloved, we can never forget the vision, the process, what it takes to do what God is calling us to do, where God is leading. Jesus uses this parable or this image or this story to talk about the reality that the, to the vision was always to bear fruit, to show forth God's glory. And that's what he says in the text. And we have to recognize that when you want to plant peace in the midst of prejudice, when you want to replace trust instead of trauma, you, when you want healing instead of hell on earth, it will likely cost you something, mostly everything. That's what the text says. It very I tell you, the seed would have to literally go in the ground. Beloved, freedom is rarely free. It is costly. Often it means you will encounter the messy, dirty underbelly of life. You'll be covered in dirt. But if you want a legacy to remain, just as a seed bears much fruit, it will cost you. And Jesus was clear about the vision and what it costs. He said, I am here so they might have life and that life abundantly to the fullest. And it will bear fruit. Jesus loved life, but he realized that there was a difference from being alive and actually living living life to the fullest. It's one thing to just be breathing. It's a whole nother thing to actually blossom. Jesus realized that the quality of life that sometimes, that we want sometimes, um, it, can, it can get a chokehold of you. We got to let go of what we thought life should be so that we can actually receive the life that God has for us. Things might actually happen another way than we imagine. So we can't just hold on to things as if they were and how they were. We have to release and let go so that God can bear more fruit. That's what happens when the seed goes into the ground. It makes provision for more fruit. We have to make a commitment or a recommitment to serve the whole world, to serve the cosmos and our community. It's the only way to live. And in the words of the late and great John Lewis, we have to get into good trouble. Beloved, don't let the vision be diluted by other things vying for your attention. Move onward and upward. Christ living in you is the hope of the world. The scripture says that God actually honors those who serve God. God's glory shows forth when we are servants to others. And we will be held accountable for what we said, what we did, and what we didn't do. See, after Jesus talked about his troubled soul, 
He was able to continue on his journey because he remembered these things. He refused to be distracted and delayed. He refused to let somebody else dilute his vision, his plan. And after he'd done all those things, he remembered who his designer was. So the fourth thing I want to suggest, after Jesus talked about his troubled soul, he was able to com he continue on his journey because he remembered one last thing. He remembered that you can never forget who your designer is. That's what happens in John chapter 28, verses 28 through 30. It says this, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Now is the time for the judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus called God his heavenly parent and called for the glory of God. He said, Father, glorify your name. He called on the weighty presence of God. He called on the power of God. And God replied, I've already glorified my name. I sent you. I have done it before and I will do it again. Your very presence brings glory and honor to God and it makes manifest the power and the presence of God it's you you are the glory of God and do it all for glory's sake you living and living in purpose and according to God's plan is God's glory in the earth and we know it was the power of God's presence because people confused it with the thunder and they said oh the thunder was cosigned and then they heard angelic or perceived angelic presence and power it reminded them of a new beginning and probably gave them a little inkling or a flashback to the Genesis text and they understood that when you hear the thunder and the movement of all of creation that something was coming to life that ignorance would be overcome the chaos would become clear things would actually come alive fully alive because that's what the text says that when we walk in the victory the knowledge fully alive the scripture says now is the time of judgment on this earth and even the prince of this world will be driven out when we remember who our designer is the God who's equipped us and created us and called us to be fully alive it says that evil will not have the last word the evil itself will be driven out and the people will draw together because there are followers of Jesus who are willing to be servants who are willing to be obedient to God who are convinced of God's dream for God's kingdom in the world for those who will not allow the princes of this world to rule for those of us who dare to be resilient and who want to recover from PTSD we are pushing back the evil that is trying to overtake us we are recommitting to our passion and to our purpose and the personhood of Jesus we will not be distracted we will not be delayed we will not be detoured we are becoming coming fully alive we are waking up from our sleep and our slumber we are focused and faithful and fearless beloved we are focusing on the things that are going to be going bring glory to God we are fixating on life we will fight for the lives of all of our sisters and our brothers because the goal from the beginning was always and continues to be life the glory of God is people who are fully alive, life full and free and fulfilled now. We are going to cry out against injustice. And when we do, the glory of the Lord is revealed. When we call out the haters and call things as hate crimes, the glory will be revealed. When we walk in the footsteps of our four mothers and sisters and aunties who took Jesus' word seriously, it is absolutely glorious. So we will continue to walk with courage and in collaboration, just like Deborah the judge walked in collaboration with Jael, the housewife. We will make sure that everybody eats, just like Martha did in the text, and for all the mommies and aunties and titties and grandmas who fixed Sunday dinner so that all could come by. We will continue to gather and meet like the Marys and the women's clubs and sororities who strategize to make the world a better place. We will preach like Jarena Lee and Lucy Farrell, even if ordination is denied. We will advocate like Mary McLeod Bethune and Rosa Parks 
Cox and others. We will sing like Marian Anderson and dance like Misty Copeland. We will write like Maya Angelou and Amanda Gorman. And we will lead and worship and sing so that all might live. And we do it for glory's sake. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God.